Okay, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, today is Sunday again and uh, we are going to go into this uh, online uh, service for the Lord. Uh, Pastor Tony was telling me that uh, I must talk to you all. Okay, so before I share today's sermon, just let me roughly, you know, uh, talk to you about what is going on with our lives here and also what I think about what is going on over there in Ilolo City. I think uh, it has uh, almost come to a month of being stranded here in Singapore. We are supposed to end our contract with the present hotel on this coming 17th of uh, June. But just on Monday, uh, the hotel front desk called us up that we have to check out way before our contract ended because our Singapore government uh, was going to take over our hotel and use it for uh, stay home notice uh, quarantine. And I think um, the government is preparing for more foreigners to come in and it is uh, mandatory that any foreigners that comes in, they have to be you know, quarantined in a designated facility. And I think the hotel where we were staying was uh, selected by the government to be one of the accommodation for those who are uh, serving their stay home notice. And uh, I need your prayers, okay? I really need all of your prayers because I can see that Pastor Tony was very frustrated uh, on hearing that, you know, we have to extend another one month contract with another hotel, you know? so. On our side here, we are also moving, you know, like a nomad, like a vagabond, you know, one month this hotel, another month that hotel, and it is not easy for us to keep adjusting, you know, to new places, and um, especially this current hotel that we're staying, though it is cheaper than the very first one that we have, uh, uh, we have stayed, you know, uh, uh, it is, it, it looks clean, but when I sat on the bed, my whole body started to itch, and I realized that, you know, my body is very, very uh, prone you know, to allergy to dust. So what I did last night was that I came to my sister's house where I placed my humongous baggage and I pulled out, you know, my dust mites vacuum cleaner for the bed, you know, and I brought it to the hotel and I vacuum, you know, the entire bed. And because of that, I was able to sleep, but still not that good a sleep because it's, it's a new place. So pray for us, okay? I think... Uh, we were quite saddened by the uh, news, you know, when we called up the embassy in Singapore. At the same time, we also asked Pastor Carlos to, uh, to inquire for us concerning the special retirement visa, okay, or special retiree visa, whatever it is. And we found out that uh, they have changed many, many rules, you know, for the application of such kind of visa. And I think they make it more stringent due to the exploitation by the PRC people. They flooded to Manila okay, for the last few years and I think this new door uh, is closed again and we are still waiting you know for the opening up of your country for foreigners to come in you know uh, we are not the only ones you know who were stranded we are looking at some of the website you know and we were reading about this couple where uh, I think the same, same they, they, they experienced the same uh, uh, setback like us where the airline uh, crew refused to let, let them pass through. They said that only the wife could fly in because the wife is the Filipina and then the, the husband has, has to be remain behind because he's a foreigner and he was so angry, he wrote a lot of vulgar words you know, against your Philippine government. Of course, uh, for both of us, uh, we, we, we don't score your government because it's still authority. But we do ask you to pray for us. Also, I heard that... Um, the uh, the Ilolo sector, the Western Versailles sector, sector all right, has uh, to go through another uh, 15 more days or maybe 14 more days of uh, MECQ, even though your mayor tried to reduce it to the general ECQ. And I think in line with that, okay, uh, even though now churches are allowed to operate uh, 30% of their actual attendance, I was discussing with all the staff and I just feel that it is still better to lock down ETAP because uh, 
the latest news of the uh, COVID is that especially this uh, uh, Delta, Delta variant, okay, it is believed it is airborne, all right? So Joy was explaining to me all these uh, mechanics, you know, of the virus, you know, being airborne and things like that. And she said that even one meter social distancing is not enough, it should be two. And uh, the breeding ground is when you congregate. So I do not want ETAP to be the breeding ground because of our congregation, uh, congregating together, and then we begin to be the breeding ground for COVID to be transmitted so freely. So I think for safety purpose and also for uh, compliance with the law, we will just lock down until end of this month. So bear with me, all right, uh, to just you know watch online the Sunday service, all right? So I hope that's about all and please cooperate with all the zone pastors in their weekday online prayer meeting. It's only 15 minutes and I am encouraging you, I'm beseeching you to join online, okay? Uh, your zone pastors, uh, zonal uh, prayer meeting. Just uh, go to their website or their Facebook and check when is the schedule and together as a body of Christ, we have to come together without the prayer of the saints, all right? The hands of God cannot move, okay? Because uh, we are called to pray, all right? So let's pray, even though we cannot see one another flesh to flesh, but let's pray using this technology called the online prayer meeting. Do that, and I, I, I want to ask you urgently to pray for us, include us in your prayer request, that God will open up the door for us to have the visa, of uh, the 9A visa or even a 9G visa if it's even possible uh, so that we can return to Ilolo as soon as possible. Praise God. Okay, today I'll be sharing quite long. Okay, last week was quite short. So this week will be very long, so bear with me. If you have a Bible, kindly turn with me to the book of Jonah, chapter 1, and I would like to read to you from verse 1 to 17 from the NIV version. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 17, NIV version. But I will just read for now, verse 1 to 6, and the remaining verses I will read later on as I come to the point of uh, the sermon midway, okay? So let's read that uh, verse 1, okay? Let's read verse 1 rather. It says here, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tashis. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tashis to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the seas to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below that, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Shall we pray? Father, this morning, I want to commit the preaching of your word to your hands. I pray that, Lord, you will use this message to encourage our hearts and to fine-tune our theology concerning different storms that will come to our life, Lord. Holy Spirit, open our eyes this morning. Clarify our thinking. Clarify our hearts. In Jesus' name, I ask and I, and, and I pray. Amen. You know, as I said again and again, uh, it's very different preaching online and preaching on site. And uh, it's been a long, long time, okay, that both of us uh, have preached to all of you live. So if let's say, you know, I mispronounce something or there's a slip on my tongue or things like that, you know, or I, I cannot pronounce a, a certain long words, you know, or, or things like that, or my grammatical uh, construction uh, is wrong, please forgive me, okay, because uh, I'm so rusty and that's why I do not mind, okay, to do this online preaching to all of you, okay? Uh, in my introduction today, all right, I want to share with you about storm, okay? Every person has what I call a storm theology, 
What is a storm theology? A storm theology is what you believe about God when storms come into your life. You see, when a crisis or a storm comes into your life, you'll be torn between these two questions. Is God a good God or is God a bad God for allowing it to happen? And also when a storm comes into your life and when you pray during the storm, do you see God as a caring or uncaring God based on how He answers? So these two, these two sections or, or these two sectors okay, of uh, questioning will form your storm theology. So let me summarize what storm theology is in a simple words, okay? Storm theology is what you believe about God when things seem to be going horribly wrong. And brothers and sisters, this morning, I would like to share a sermon on refining our storm theology. And we need the Holy Spirit right now to teach us how to respond and how to trust God during our storm of crisis and how to look at Him in the right way when storm hits our life. And this will constitute a very strong and sound storm theology. In my sermon this morning, I would like to bring to your attention four things. Number one, the definition, effects and types of storms. Number two, the storm of Jonah. Number three, the storm of the twelve disciples. And number four, refining our storm theology. So this morning is a parallel study. We'll study one storm from the Old Testament and another storm from the New Testament and then we'll do a comparative study. Okay, let's look at our very first main point, the definition, effects and types of storm. So what is storm? According to the dictionary, the dictionary defines storm as a disturbance of the normal condition of the atmosphere, manifesting itself by winds of unusual force or direction, often accompanied by rain, snow, hail, thunder and lightning, or flying sand or dust. Okay, that is the definition by the dictionary concerning physical storm. Figuratively and biblically speaking, the stormy seas in the Bible have always been compared to what I call the crisis of life. To simply put, we Christian call uh, the storms as the storms of life. Now, storms of life come to us whether we like it or not. They terrify us. They knock us around and threaten to destroy all our stability and security. We don't know whether we can survive them and we don't know how long they will last. At least, this is how a storm at sea would be for most of us. What about the effects of storm? Storms in life have the ability to bring to the surface what is really inside of us. Storm, especially in a form of crisis, will reveal to you and me whether we are all living by faith or by fear. Storms will also reveal to you if your heart is full of trust or full of doubt. And the way we react to God during a storm reveals the truth about ourselves whether we want it or not. What about the types? There are two kinds of storm that I would like, that I would like to share with you this morning. The very first kind is what I call storms as a result of our disobedience as is exemplified in the life of Jonah. The second type is the storms which are the results of our obedience as is exemplified in the life of the 12 disciples in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. Let me ask you some questions. You know, we have been uh, absent, Pastor Tony and, uh, uh, and I, we have been absent from ETAP for one and a half years now. So I really do not know what is going on with your life during these one and a half years. So may I ask you this question? In the last one and a half years, have you been hit by literal storms, by the typhoons or the hurricanes, or even worse, by terrifying storms of life? If so, 
How did all those storms affect you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically? What kind of storm did you face? Was it one as a result of your explicit disobedience like Jonah? Or was it one simply because you obeyed God? Or simply because you are in the will of the Lord? Number two, the second main point, the storm of Jonah. Let's study it in detail uh, this morning. As you all know, Jonah was a prophet who fled God's call to warn Nineveh of the coming judgment. He foolishly jumped onto a boat to Tashis instead of obeying God. And in response, God threw a great storm upon the ship. So you can see here, obviously, that the storm of Jonah was definitely one as a result of his disobedience to God, of his unwillingness to obey the call of God. Let's continue to read Jonah 1 from where we have left off in the beginning. Let's continue uh, with verse 7. It says here, Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Verse 9, he answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea come down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and make vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah is in a mess here, and we think, well, he deserved it. He did, but we shouldn't be too smug about it too. Consider our own life too this morning. Who among us has not run from God? Maybe we have not actually jumped onto a boat to Tashis, but we all at one point or another have run from God, if not physically, certainly in our heart. Yes, many of us have run away from God in our heart. We are all Jonah. Jonah is not an anomaly. Jonah is not the weird one here. Jonah is not the, uh, the, the exception. Rather, Jonah is the norm. God purposely gives Jonah not merely as a bad example to learn from, but as a window into our soul. Whether we like it or not, we are all like Jonah, fugitives on the run from God. What does that mean? The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that no one is outside the need of God's grace. Not moral Jonah, nor immoral Nineveh. No one is so good that they don't need God's grace and no one is so bad that they cannot get God's grace. God is saying to us today, as He does throughout the entire Bible, that our sin is uglier than we can imagine and His grace is greater than we can hope for. Jonah chapter 1 verse 7 to 17 is teaching us two important things. Firstly, your sin will find you out. And this is found okay, in uh, verse 7 to verse 10. 
There is a deep truth running through the word of God and running through the world. And that is evil exists and evil is exposed. The Bible calls evil sin. Now, it's not easy for everyone to recognize sin as evil living within each of us. Because many of us, especially Christians, we think that we are basically good people who do bad things from time to time. But if you were to be very honest, you realize that the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says that we are really bad people who do good things from time to time by God's grace. Jonah here is a classic example. Here is a prophet, one of the godliest men in his nation, and we see here that he's running from the presence of God because he doesn't want God to be merciful to his enemies. We look at Jonah's life and we are probably a little amazed at how unconcerned he seems to be. Okay, he, in the key text, we read that he was asleep in the sheep. How could he sleep, knowing what he had done? Well, at this point, he didn't yet see the evil of what he had done. No one else even knew about his disobedience. It didn't seem to be a problem initially. After all, the ship was there, ready to go. So why did God make it so easy to run if he didn't want him to? Here is the problem. Sin is deceptive. And part of the deceptive power of sin is convincing us that we are really not that bad. That is why Jonah could not see the gravity of his disobedience. Jonah couldn't see the gravity of his sin. And that was why he could lay down and go to sleep. In application, this is what I'm trying to share. When we are deceived by sin, we are not bothered by sin. In fact, it is possible to be so deceived that we actually feel justified in our sin. Sin questions God. It whispers as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? This is how Jonah felt. As if he were right and God was wrong. Mercy for the Ninevites? No way, that's God's will. They are the evil empire. And they were. They were, I mean, the Ninevites were really the bad, wicked, and ruthless people. You know that the Ninevites are actually referring to the Babylonians. But apparently, God loves really bad people, Nineveh and Jonah. Jonah's plan for his life didn't include running from God. Who does? But over time, Jonah put up walls around the word of God. So when God called him to Nineveh, Jonah would not obey because long before he put up the wall of nationalism, Jonah already limited what God could ask of him. To put it simply, Jonah drifted from God. He didn't see the drift because we, like him, also never see the drift. He drifted away slowly, but he could still see the shore. So he still felt he operated within the calling. He wasn't cheating on his wife. He wasn't stealing. He was being a good Israelite. But over time, he drifted far, if not, he drifted far enough away that when God asked him to go beyond his own land to his enemies, he could not and would not. Not only that, he was appalled that God would even ask of him. Let me ask you this question this morning. Have you been drifting slowly away from God during this pandemic? Sure, in your slow drift, you can still see the shock. You can still see some resemblance of spiritual uh, uh, life. You can still see the church. You know, you can still see some religious activities going on in your life. But deep inside, in your private and watch life, you are slowly drifting away from God. Are there some things that God asked you this morning that are appalling to you? Drifting happens when two evil coincide. First is we neglect God's word and secondly, we accept an alternative message. And that is exactly what happened to Jonah. He ignored God's word 
to go to Nineveh and accepted an alternative word that God should judge, not forgive Nineveh. Jonah turned the most merciful person in the world into an unforgiving judge and he thought he was justified in doing so. This morning, if we were to project all our thoughts about God from this passage onto a screen, what would God look like? Would he resemble the God of the Bible or is it the God of your moralistic imagination? When we refuse to listen to all of God's word and substitute other more palatable messages instead, we set our, ourselves on a path to sin big time. And we might not even see the depths of it until something extraordinary comes along and wakes us up. Something like what I would call storm at sea and a group of pagan sailors pleading with us to pray for salvation. So this answers the question why God did not stop Jonah from running away because God had already prepared a storm to wake this prophet up. The storm forced out of Jonah more than an inward consideration of his failings. It forced his failings to his mouth before many witnesses Jonah thought he ran from God's presence. He thought his sin was his own personal issue, but his sin found him out. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you this truth. God knows, no matter where you are, if you are faithful or not. Others may not know your sin because you may hide it so well, but God does. Let's look at verse 7, where it says that the sailor cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Casting lots was an old way of answering an unanswerable question. And for it to fall on Jonah means there was no mere coincidence. It was clearly a divine providence. God used the pagan sailors to confront the prophet with his sin. Let's look at the, let's look at the irony here. Pagan sailors doing what the prophet should have done. So they confronted him in verse 8. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Jonah answered in verse 9. I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. In some version, in the underlined uh, sentence there, uh, instead of putting I fear the Lord, uh, is the phrase I worship the Lord. Okay, but I'm giving you a translation that put the word I fear the Lord. It is a very interesting response. Jonah is technically right about who he is and who God is. He is a Hebrew. He is an Israelite. And God is really the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. But there seems to be a disconnect here in the middle. Does Jonah fear the Lord? He doesn't look like it. Okay, Jonah got the questions right doctrinally, but he was wrong relationally. Now, before you judge him, let's look at our own life. Does our doctrine line up with our life? Are we proclaiming one thing about God while relating to Him differently? Do we claim to fear the Lord while riding the fling boat of rebellion? Do we claim that we worship the Lord and yet we worship sex? Yet we worship fornication, yet we worship romance, and yet we worship greed, and yet we worship addiction to drugs and cigarettes. You see, there is a disconnect here. There is one question though that Jonah didn't answer, and that question is, what is your occupation? Jonah was a prophet, but he didn't tell the sailors that. Why? He was actually awakening to the cost of his sin. How could he tell them, you know, that he was a prophet when he failed to speak God's word? By this point, the sailors understood Jonah's sin. During the conversation, he told them he was running from God. They knew then the reason the storm was so strong. Verse 10 says they became exceedingly afraid. Literally, they feared a greater fear. Jonah said he feared God. But actually, it is the pagan sailors who act like God fearers. They cried out, what is it you have done? Now, that isn't a question. It is an accusation. Okay, it's more like an exclamation mark. 
and it points to this. When our sin finds us out, it is shocking. Jonah's sin found him out and he was about to face the consequence, which is actually our second point. So this is the second lesson we can learn from Jonah today from our key text. Your sin will have consequences. Verse 11 says, the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea come down for us? Notice the language of the sailors. What shall we do to you? Jonah's sin required something to be done to him. Brothers and sisters, let's not let sin deceive us. Sin requires something to be done. It can't be passed over. It must be paid for. Sin is costly. And here we see Jonah's sin involved the sailors merely by their proximity to him. The sailors did nothing wrong to warrant this storm. But they were hit by the storm simply because they were close to Jonah. So it is costly not only unto us, but to those around us. And brothers and sisters, let me give you this very harsh lesson today. Breaking covenant with God or disobedience to God has tangible consequences and the actions of the individual always affect the community. You don't sin alone, you don't sin privately. You definitely will adversely affect the community around you, especially those who are in close proximity to you. God sends a storm. First, it ruins the sailors' commercial prospect as they are forced to throw all their cargoes into the sea to lighten the ship. Eventually, it threatens their very lives. Only when Jonah offers to be thrown into the sea, which the sailor reluctantly accept, does the storm abate and the danger to the community subside. As an application, this is the lesson. If we accept that we are called to serve God, then we recognize that failing to serve God in whatever sphere He calls us also diminishes our communities. The more powerful our gifts and talent, the greater the harm we are apt to do if we reject God's guidance in our lives. Yes, our disobedience to God can do great harm in the fields of business, government, society, science, religion, and all the rest. Our gifts may seem puny in comparison, yet imagine the good we could do and the evil we could avert if only we obey the calling of God in our life. The first and foremost calling is be holy as I am holy. Thus say the Lord. So never think that our sin only harms us privately. Sin harms us and those around us, especially those closest to us. So this morning, I want to direct my question to this group of people. Today, you're suffering. Is your suffering, you know, of this so-called storm as a result of someone who is close to you, who has been disobedient to God, and he or she has broken the calling of God upon her life? If so, today's message is for you. Until Jonah's sin was dealt with, the storm only grew in intensity. Isn't that how sin goes? The longer we delay confession, the more horrible the storm becomes. Jonah knew the solution and in verse 12 he says, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah realized that for the sailors to be saved, he must sacrifice himself. The sailors rejected the proposal of Jonah and so they rowed hard to get back to the dry land. But their rowing was in vain. Literally in verse 13, it says they dug in their oars just as Jonah dug in his oars to Tashis instead of to Nineveh. Brothers and sisters, sin always urges us to dig in our oars against God's purpose. But God will not allow it. 
Verse 13 says, The sailors could not get to the dry land. And the lesson is this, we can never go further from God than He will allow. Ray Othlund says this, God has more ways of confronting us than we have ways of evading Him. No matter how intelligent and cunning you are to hide your sin, sin will find you out. And God will confront you to face the consequence of your sin. When the sailors realized the rowing was in vain, their response was to cry out to the Lord. Jonah, the prophet of God, would not turn to God, but these hidden sailors did. They turned to prayer, asking God not to hold what they were about to do against them. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. Jonah's sin faced its consequences, and the sea became calm. Storms are normal part of life, but calming a storm at sea like this is a miracle. The calmness of the sea led to a new awareness among the sailors. And in verse 16, it says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. That kind is the kind of reverent awe that befalls those who have seen the Lord. I believe the sailors thought to themselves, Who is this God that can calm the storm? In a time when they too faced the consequences of their sin, they found at the end a calm by way of Jonah's sacrifice. But what about Jonah? He must have felt useless. He threw it all away and it was time now to face the judge once and for all. At some point in our life, brothers and sisters, we are going to face similar situations. We are going to see our sin for what it is and we are going to have to face the consequences. What will that time be like? As Jonah fell into the sea, he knew it was what he deserved. The storm was a direct consequence of his disobedience. But when he hit the water, he got something he didn't deserve. And I will share about this undeserved thing in my last point. But... First, let us look at the third main point of this uh, sermon, and that is the storm of the twelve disciples. Let's read Mark chapter four, verse thirty-five to. Uh, uh, let's read uh, verse thirty-five onwards. It says here, uh, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, "Let us go over to the other side." Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, just like the one that happened uh, to the pump boats okay, uh, of Gimaras that killed a few people. Okay, so a furious squall came up and a wave broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in a stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is a second account of the storm in the Bible. But this time, it is not a storm as a result of one's disobedience to God, but it is one that results from our obedience to to Jesus. To put it simply, the storm happened to the disciples simply because they were in the will of God. For it was Jesus who said to them, let us go over to the other side. It was Jesus who commanded them to go into the boat, to sail to the other side. So you can see that this is the second type of storm that will hit your life at one point or another. Storm that is a result, not because of your sin, not because of your disobedience, but simply because you obey the Lord. So there are a few lessons we can learn from this New Testament storm, which is quite similar to that of Jonah. Okay, first and foremost is storms are tests. It's during the storms of your life and say again and again that you will discover what you really believe. Okay, it's during the storms of your life that you will really, you know, uh, know what really is your storm theology. 
Storms have a way of revealing the truth about you. Notice that the storm that hit the disciples came in the evening, not in the day. Verse 35 says, as the evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. In order to understand the significance of this word evening, we must understand what happened during the daytime. What happened during the up loud. Okay, now, this narrative of the storm was recorded in Mark chapter 4. So if you want to know what happened to them during the day, you have to read Mark chapter 3. So in Mark chapter 3, we were told that, you know, Jesus had a very busy day. Okay, in Mark 3, 20, we, 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 we read that Jesus had a confrontation with some Pharisees. We read also in Mark chapter 3 that his brothers came to see him and tried to take him away. We also read in Mark chapter 3 that Jesus spent the rest of the day teaching the kingdom of God to the public. And here you can see that the disciples had a front, front row seat to the teachings of Jesus about God's kingdom and to the miracles Jesus had performed during the day. And now that evening had come, Storm was looking at one corner. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to share with you by stressing on the word evening is this. It's not enough to merely learn a lesson or be able to repeat a teaching. We must also be able to apply what we have been taught, what we have been preached to. We must be able to apply all the lessons we learn by faith. And that is one reason why God allows storms to come into our life. Storms are tests and opportunities to demonstrate how much we have learned, how much we have assimilated the teachings. Okay, storms are tests and opportunities to demonstrate, all right, our assimilation, to demonstrate our ability to apply what we have been taught and also to demonstrate our trust in God. Another thing we can learn from this New Testament storm is that storm happened on the other side of life. Jesus said, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Here Jesus is talking about getting in the boat and going to the other side of the lake. But his statement reminds us about the other side of life. On this side of the lake, Jesus had performed miracles, confronted the Pharisees, as I said just now, taught about the kingdom of God and the crowds were growing and everything was looking good. On this side, the disciples' faith and trust in Jesus had been so easy and fun, but on the other side, they were about to be tested. They didn't know it, but a storm was coming on the other side. On this side, things are going well, but on the other side, things are about to get tough. As an application, this is what I can say to you this morning. The other side of good health is illness. How will you respond? Your faith is going to be tested on the other side. The other side of the honeymoon is a broken relationship. How will you respond? Your faith is going to be tested on the other side. The other side of obedience is disobedience. How will you respond when you found out that your kid has become so rebellious and disobedient. Your faith is going to be tested on the other side. The other side of prosperity is poverty. How will you respond? Your faith is going to be tested on the other side. Storms are tests and those tests occur on the other side of life. There's always two sides to our life. This side and the other side. Are you on the other side of life now where the storm is raging? Can you now see that such kind of storm is not because of your disobedience? Next, storms happen suddenly. Soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Verse 37. These were hurricane-like winds and Matthew described this event as a violent storm. So it's not only fierce, but violent. And this fierce and violent storm happened suddenly. And that is the way life is. One moment you are doing well, and the next the bottom falls out. One phone call, 
and you find yourself in the middle of the storm. You know, a few storms hit our life last year. And uh, I, if you can remember my past sermon, I did tell you about the phone calls, two phone calls that I received. Recently, I also received another phone call and it was bad news. So every time when Pastor Tony calls me up through the landline, you know, my heart would start beating. And one day I reprimanded him. I said, can you please stop calling me via the landline? It's always never good news. If you want, just text me, you know. He, he, he finds it very difficult to call me through my Philippine phone. So he always call me through landline. And it's, okay, three out of four phone calls are always bad news. So, you know, this is my phobia, all right. And I thought I was the only one feeling it. And uh, just recently, you know, my sister also received one uh, landline call from Pastor Tony. And when he returned to my sister's house, my sister whacked him down. I said, can you please stop calling, you know, the landline. You always put us, you know, on, on, on a nervous mode, you know. We, 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 we get so nervous each time when the phone, uh, the landline uh, rings. So, <laughs> what am I trying to tell you? We are fearful, you know, of this sudden nature of another storm coming from the mouth of Pastor Tony, alright. So, let's go back to our example again. One doctor's visit and you're in a storm. One conversation and you're in a storm. God does not try to trick us with this. God is not trying to hide something, you know, uh, 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 from us. Rather, God is being upfront and honest about the storms of life. Storms are a reality of life, you know, uh, albeit, okay, that means even though you are obedient, even though you may be faultless, or even though you may be in the will of God. Okay, storms happen suddenly and those storms will test and reveal your faith and spiritual maturity. Brothers and sisters, today I share this sermon because I want you to re-examine your storm theology to see if this reality about the suddenness and the violence of storm happening to Christians who are in the will of God is included. In your storm theology, do you include Storms hitting your life, even when you are in the will of God. If not, such kind of storms will devastate you. And this leads me to another characteristic about storms. Storms can cause you to doubt God. If your theology, your storm theology is not strong, it's not refined. If you do not refine your storm theology by including such storm to come upon your life, even though you're walking in the will of God, then storms can cause you to doubt God. So if you form a theology such that if I serve God, if I have enough faith, if I pray enough, I won't get COVID. That kind of theology is very flimsy. What if you have prayed? What if you have given one million as your tithe. What if you have served God to the point you bleed? What if, you know, you, 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 you have read the Bible from the first book until the 66th book? What if you really exercise all your faith and COVID still happened to you? Hey, don't think it's, it's not happening. I just talked to Pastor Guna and I asked him during the wedding of Jen, say, how are all those... Uh, uh, Indian trainers that train us during the Bangkok CTC. He said, oh, this uh, Indian guy, oh, I, I, I love his training. He, he is good, you know. He and his wife got COVID. And also, one of the church planters that attended, he and his wife also got COVID. I think, I cannot remember, is it the one from Bangladesh or from Pakistan? I cannot remember, but I, I got mixed up. And he said, then Pastor Gunnar told me, there are few planters under CTC who even died of COVID. So if your storm theology is not refined and you define storm theology that if I serve God as a missionary, if I serve God as this and that, this and that, then, you know, storms will not hit me. Look at, look at the, 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 the global storm now. I mean, the, the most current global storm that none is able to control it totally is the COVID storm, the pandemic. So if you are tested positive and your storm theology is such that if I serve God, if I'm in the will of God, if I obey God, I won't get COVID. Then I tell you, 
And if COVID happens to you, you will start doubting God. You will be very disillusioned with God. You will be very angry with God. Because you are using your own righteousness, your own morality, to put God into your debt. I do this and this and this, huh? so you owe me this. I, I think you have to eradicate such kind of uh, wrong theology from your belief system. I mean, look at Pastor Tony and me. Okay, yeah, we love the Lord. We believe Him, we serve Him, you know. I mean, we are missionaries. We gave up everything just to obey the call of God. And then look at us. We prayed so hard, you know. We, we, we bought the tickets, we booked the hotel, you know, to, to, to show to you and also to prove to you that it's not that we are enjoying our life here. We really want to go back. But it was the wedding of my daughter that held me back and looking at the fluid situation of air, uh, of this uh, travel by air, you know, we, we, we felt that it is better not to go back to the Philippines. If not, we will get trapped. So we stayed on and we thought after the wedding, yeah, we can just fly off. Who knows? God still closed the door. So how? This is a form of, this is a milestone for me. And I thought that, oh, because, you know, we've been praying, been covering ourselves by the blood. We were staying in this hotel. And then one day I came back to the room and I saw that my room was not uh, clean. And I was very upset because I really didn't like this chambermaid that cleaned up the hotel room. You know, she always rang my bell at a certain time. You know, there are certain times I wanted to sleep longer. But because of her, I couldn't sleep longer. Because of her, Pastor Tony got to fetch me very early in the morning to come to my sister's house. So one time she ring the bell and I was just sleeping. So I opened and told her, can you come back later? She said, cannot. Because she had 50 rooms to clean. So I questioned her in Mandarin. So I asked her nicely, I said, so I am the guest of this hotel and I have to submit to your time schedule. So she nicely explained to me, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I didn't want to fight with her. Remember, okay, the dealing of God over my pride, you know. My old self would be, I really will wet her down, but I was just, you know, being uh, compliant, you know, by uh, nicely, you know, listening to explanation. So I thought that, okay, it's all right. I will submit to your time schedule. I will not be around during this time. Definitely, I will be out of my room by this time so you can clean. But... That day when I came back, it wasn't clean at all. And I was upset. I said, wow, you chased me out and in the end, you didn't clean my room. So I called the front desk. I said, what is this? You know, why is there no cleaning? You know, and I was complaining to the front desk about, you know, uh, the stringent uh, uh, schedule of the uh, chamber mates and things like that. And in the end, when I submitted, you know, it was not done. So the receptionist just pacified me and said, uh, man, please do not be angry. Let me tell you something that is uh, that is confidential. I said, what happened? You said that you will not be getting housekeeping service today and tomorrow because our front desk uh, 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 receptionist is uh, tested positive. I, I, I tell you, I, I, I was taken aback. I said, oh no, in Singapore, if one get it, a whole block, okay, will be called on off and all go for testing. To cut the story short, we were waiting, you know, for the hotel to instruct us whether we need to be swapped, you know. None was forthcoming until maybe four or five days later, Ministry of Health called Pastor Tony up and in the end also called me up, you know, and sent us, you know, for swap test. And I was so nervous. Okay, the person that did my swap test wasn't very good. But the person that did the swap test for Pastor Tony was very good. And when she swapped my test, she asked me not to breathe. And I was struggling, you know, and she was poking and poking and, you know, swirling and swirling, you know, I, 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 I was like, you know, it was so painful, you know, and, okay, try your best not to be swapped, okay, and stay safe, please stay safe, because when you are swapped, okay, it's not a pleasant feeling, alright. So, I had to wait for the test result. Pastor Tony got his the next day, very early, and mine didn't come. I waited and waited, you know, for the SMS to be sent to me. I didn't receive any and, and I was panicking. I said, oh God, is it I got COVID? But thank God, you know, I went online to search how to get my results online if you don't call me. And I managed to find this website, downloaded the app, and I went into the app using my SingPass 
and I saw the result, it was negative, praise the Lord. So this is a, a kind of ordeal I went through. Why, why, why I went through with fright? Because I know this theology. It does not mean that you're Christian, storms will not hit you. It does not mean that when you're in the will of God, storms, yes, I, I believe in protection. But what if not? But what if not? What if, what if God sovereignly, sovereignly will for you to go through a sudden storm on the other side of your life? Look at the three Hebrew boys. You know, when they were thrown into the furnace, they believed that God would deliver them. But if not, they also added, but if not. Their theology of the furnace of fire is very sound. We believe that God, Yahweh, will deliver us. But if not, we will still trust the Lord. So same thing for the storm. Your storm theology must include, yes, God, we will try our very best, okay, to cooperate with you, to align our life with you, to align our will with your will, that will be done on earth as it's written in heaven. We will obey because we love you, not because we are using our obedience to put you into our debt. But after having done all this, like the disciples, they obey a direct command of Jesus to get into the boat. And yet the storm hit them. So if you do not refine your storm theology, then it will cause you to doubt God. Okay? So let me repeat, if you do not refine your storm theology by including such a storm to come upon your life, even though you are walking in the will of God, then the storms can cause you to doubt God. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teachers, or rather teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? Here you can see the humanity of Jesus. He is fully God and fully man. But at this instance, you can see, you know, his human nature is at work. He's exhausted. After a whole day of activities, therefore, he was sleeping. Now, the questioning of the disciples. Can you sense a spirit accusation in the questioning of the disciples unto Jesus? First of all, I'm not downplaying the disciples' fears and worries. The disciples' concern about drowning was completely normal and reasonable, just like your worries, just like, you know, your concern. They were professional fishermen. They knew how to handle a boat during a storm, but this storm was different. This storm was fierce and violent, and they believed they were all going to die. What the disciples don't know is that this storm is going to be used by Jesus to teach them some incredible things about himself and about themselves. And this leads me to the next point. Storm teach you about God. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the wave, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Verse 39. The way Jesus rebuked the wind may be an indication who was behind the storm. Because the word rebuke was also used in Mark 1.25 when Jesus was rebuking a demon. So it could be possible that this unexpected storm was an attack by the devil himself. Whether it was a devil or not, the result was the same. Suddenly, the wind stopped and there was great calm. Jesus commanded, silence, be still, and immediately the storm obeyed. Jesus had just demonstrated his authority over nature itself. And the disciples are beginning to learn more about who this Jesus really is. Brothers and sisters, when you are in the middle of a storm, it is there that God can demonstrate who He is very clearly to you if He so chooses. There are many, many lessons you can learn about God in the middle of your own storm. Storms also teach you about yourself. So here you see a fierce storm comes out of nowhere during the night. Jesus is sleeping from exhaustion. The waves start crashing up against the boat and the sea starts pouring into the boat. That means water starts coming into the boat and the disciples have lost control. They begin to fear. They can't believe that Jesus is still asleep even though you know they are shouting at him to wake up and when he awakens, they say, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? Jesus immediately rebukes the wind. The wind and the waves obey and the sea becomes like glass. And then Jesus turns and says to them, Why are you 
afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, the Lord's rebuke here is not about the disciples' reaction to the storm, but rather it is about their reaction to Jesus in the storm. Notice the word they ask, Teacher, don't you care? Hey, they call Jesus teacher and not Lord and not Adonai. Adonai means king, master. So their understanding of him was not where it needed to be. And instead of asking Lord, can you help us? They question his love and concern for them. And brothers and sisters, we are like the disciples in so many ways. This is the same temptation we face when we become afraid. Because of the storm in our life, we see God as less than He, less than He is. Not only that, we also doubt His love and care for us. And that is exactly what the devil wants you to do. Their fear blinded them to who Jesus really was. You see, this verse always follows me in my life. Those who know the name of the Lord put their trust in Him. If in your storm, you know the wrong name of God, like in the case of the disciples, they call Him teacher instead of Adonai, then Jesus would seem like a human to you. No authority, no mastery over the situation, over the storm, over the waves. But if you know the right name, Adonai, you are Adonai, God. You, Jesus, you are Adonai. You are master, you are king. You are king over the waves. You are master over the waves. Then you will cool down. You will calm down. You will trust God. You will not fret. You will not panic. You will learn something about yourself in the middle of the storm. You will really learn where your faith really is. And for the disciples, if you have a barometer to measure their faith, their faith is at bottom. Their faith is in the wrong name. I mean, Jesus is teacher, but in the situation, he's not teacher. In the situation, he is really the master of storms. So in the barometer, their faith was really that low. Many times you think that your faith is this level, but when the storm comes and tests your faith, it's actually that low. That's why faith which is more precious than anything. It's the one thing that God always wants to refine and polish till that from the bottom, we get to know who He is, it will go up higher. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So, God will use tongues to stretch your faith, to increase your faith. Verse 41, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They ask each other, even the wind and the waves obey him. Up to this point, the disciples knew Jesus was special and unique. They knew that he was a great teacher. They knew that God was working with him and through him. However, this storm started a paradigm shift in their thinking about who Jesus really is. You see, prophets of the past have performed various miracles, but this seems completely different. You know, whatever miracles uh, uh, Elijah or Elisha performed, they had to ask God. They had to ask God. But not Jesus. When there's a storm, he didn't ask God. He didn't ask Yahweh. He commanded. This is the type of power reserved for God and God alone. Who is this man? And this leads me to my last main point, refining our strong theology. Let me repeat this question. Who is this man? In order to answer this question, let's revert to our Jonah story. Just now, we stopped at Jonah chapter 1, verse 16, where the sailors threw Jonah overboard into the sea and the storm ceased. Verse 17 says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Uh, in the book of Jonah, the word great fish is mentioned, but in the book of Matthew, Jesus said he was a whale. Okay? Now, coming back to verse 17 again. Jonah didn't deserve this fish. Just now I told you that Jonah got what he deserved for his sin. 
And when he was thrown overboard to the sea, he got what he didn't deserve. What did he not deserve? Jonah didn't deserve this big fish. He deserved God's wrath. But brothers and sisters, you see here, God always gave his people better than what we deserve. With God, as amazing as it sounds, our sin is swallowed by his grace. Jonah was swallowed by the big fish. And the big fish is the providence of God. The big fish is an emblem of God's grace. As the wave swallowed Jonah, God's grace came to the sailors. And as Jonah was swallowed by the fish, God's grace also came to Jonah, the sinning prophet himself. I ask you this morning, when did God's grace come to you? Has it yet? Maybe you need to see your sins first. Maybe you need to suffer the consequence of your sin first. I know that sounds terrifying, but we can trust God with it. There is a deep spiritual truth that we can affirm from the Bible, but it is very difficult for us to believe. And this is the truth that I want to share with you this morning. When we cover our sins in darkness, God will drag them out to the light. Jonah is proof of that. But when we drag our sin into the light, God will cover them with the cross. Hallelujah. We can keep running from God or we can stop and face Him. Our only hope is casting ourselves upon His mercy and grace. Our only hope is turning away from our sin and towards Him. And what will happen when we do that? Let's study again deeper into this New Testament account. The greatest commentary in the New Testament is the no, I mean the greatest commentary in the Old Testament is the New Testament. And in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus commented on this verse. He says this, The Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign to prove himself. But Jesus answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign to be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for repentance at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Here Jesus is affirming Jonah's prophetic voice. That Jonah speaks of him. Jonah speaks of Jesus. Jonah is a type of Christ. And of course, Jesus did not seem like Jonah. Jesus did not say another Jonah is here. No. Jesus said one greater than Jonah is here. Simply put, Jesus is the greater Jonah. How is Jesus greater? Let's look at the comparison. Let's look at the differences. Jonah heard God's call and said, Not your will, but mine. But Jesus heard God's call and said, Not my will, but thine. Jonah showed no care for the lost. He didn't care about the sailors on the ship and he didn't care about the Ninevites in their sin. The compassion of God didn't melt his heart. It angered him. But Jesus came to seek and save the lost. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jonah fought against God's heart, but Jesus is God's baggy to so on. Jonah brought news of God's grace, but Jesus is God's grace. Jonah was thrown overboard for his own sin. But Jesus was thrown overboard for the sins of others. For your sins and my sins. Jonah's sacrifice caused the storm at sea to cease. But Jesus' sacrifice caused the storm of God's wrath, wrath to cease. Jonah was swallowed by the great fish that saved him from death. But Jesus, but Jesus swallowed sin on the cross to save his people from death. God loved the Ninevites enough to send Jonah. But God so loved the world, He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, when you read the book of Mark, especially Mark chapter 4, the key text that I just read to you, you will also notice that Mark is intentionally recapping the Jonah episode in Mark chapter 4. Mark uses nearly identical words and phrases. Both Jesus and Jonah are in the book. Just now I showed you the differences. Now let me show you the similarity. 
Okay, as I told you right from the beginning, today's sermon is a parallel study of the Old Testament storm and the New Testament storm, or the book of Jonah and the book of Mark is parallel. Okay, so let's look at the similarity here. Both Jonah and Jesus are in a boat. Both are in the storm described in similar terms. Both boats are filled with others who are terrified of death. Both groups wake the sleeping prophets angrily rebuking them. Both storms are miraculously calm and the companions safe. Both storms conclude with the men in the boat more terrified after the storm is still than they were before. So these are the similarities. Every feature is the same with one rather large apparent exception. Jonah is sacrificed into the storm, thrown into the deep, satisfying the wrath of God so that the others will be saved. But Jesus is not. When Jesus was thrown into the storm, he died. Jonah did not die, but our Lord Jesus died. So who is this man? Well, Jesus is the greater and ultimate Jonah who was thrown into the ultimate deep of eternal justice for us. How ironic it is that in Mark chapter 4, the disciple asked, Teachers, don't you care if we drown? They believe Jesus is going to sleep on them in their hour of the greatest need, in the hour of their greatest storm. Actually, it's the other way around. In the garden of Gethsemane, they will go to sleep on him. They will truly abandon him. And yet, he loves them to the end. See, Jonah was thrown overboard for his own sin. But Jesus is thrown into the ultimate storm for our sin. Jesus was able to save the disciples from the storm because he was thrown into the ultimate storm and died on their behalf. Now, this is a more powerful, heart-changing motivation for us to trust God. Instead of me today telling you as a preacher to have more faith, more faith in Christ, this is the usual sermon we have been preaching concerning this chapter on Mark chapter 4. Have faith in God, have faith in God. This is our usual way of always exhorting you in the midst of your storm to have faith in God. And such kind of exhortation is entailing more of your effort, which can be quite crushing. What if you have no faith right now? Because the storm of life that you are undergoing is so huge. That's why today, I want to refine the storm theology. Instead of crushing and banging on your head to trust God more, to have, to, to have more faith on God, I'm asking you to have a more vivid picture of the gospel of salvation by Jesus for your storm. I'm asking you to look at the bigger picture of the cross. The cross carries all the symbolism of the storms of Jonah. Jonah was thrown overboard so that he can save others and so that he can save himself. But Jesus this morning is trying to show you graphically that he was also like Jonah, a better Jonah. He was thrown overboard to the ultimate storm and he died so that whatever storms you're going through today you won't die you won't die don't let the devil lie to you na ako, na kita. no you won't die you won't die because he died for you but then you say eh, how can you say my husband died of cancer well he made a provision if the greatest storm that's hitting your life now is cancer hey if you share the gospel to whoever that's sick, to whoever that's on the other side of life, the other side of health, which is disease and sickness, if you share the gospel, even if he died physically, he can still live spiritually and eternally if he accepts Jesus Christ. He won't die eternally if you share to him the gospel. Are you in some kind of storm in your life right now? Have you prayed and felt like God must be asleep and the twelve disciples that are dead? He's not. I can assure you, Jesus is not sleeping. How do you know? Because Jesus faced that ultimate storm 
and endure it for you and me. So today, we can know for sure He will not abandon us in our infinitely smaller storms. So why not trust the one who did that for you? Rest your faith in what Christ has really done for you, rather than squirming to have more faith in Him. When we face our sin openly and honestly and turn to God with open hands of faith, God will swallow our sin in Christ. God will swallow our sin in the at the cross. He will not throw us overboard because Christ has already been thrown overboard for you and me. He endured the wrath for us and we can now have this storehouse of His great mercy and grace. The grave could not hold Him. And if you believe in the one greater than Jonah, then the grave cannot hold you either. It turns out that when we hurl ourselves into the ocean of God's justice, we find at the bottom God's mercy and grace. So for those of you who have sinned against God, and right now sin has found you out, and yet right now you're, you are you know, suffering the consequences of your sin. That's why for the last few weeks I've been stressing on repentance. When you repent and you turn and go back to God. Yeah, when you face the consequence of your sin, it seems that you have reached the rock bottom of your spiritual life. But please, remember, when you are going through and facing the consequence of your sin, you face it with the greater Jonah in view. On the cross, he has already obtained God's grace and mercy for you. So your rock bottom is not just rock bottom. You have Christ with you. You still have Christ in the boat with you. Even though it may seem he's silent, he's sleeping. He's not. He's still in the same boat as you. At the bottom or at the rock bottom, there's always God's mercy and grace. So refining our storm theology means this. Face whatever storm of life, be it because of your sin or not, with our greater and ultimate Jonah in view. To the degree you see Jesus as the ultimate and greater, uh, greater Jonah, being thrown overboard to the sea for our sins, and thereby calming the raging storms of God's wrath, to that degree will be your trust and faith in Him in the midst of your storm and all the striving on your own, to exercise more faith in Him, will be gone. To the degree you see that even the sinless Christ has to undergo the ultimate storm of being thrown into a fiery storm of God's wrath, to that degree will you manage your expectation and refine your storm theology by getting rid of the wrong theology. And that is, if I am a Christian, if I serve God properly, I will never face any storm. Refine your storm theology. Adjust it in accordance to the gospel, adjust it in accordance to what you have learned from the Bible today. In conclusion, today if you feel more like Jonah than Jesus, don't worry. God will send storms into your life. He uses them as intervention to show us who we are. And when our sin finds us out, and when we face the consequences, God has a word for us that blows us away. God looks us square in the eyes without coddling us, without downplaying our sin and presents His answers to our sin. There's one greater than Jonah who speaks a better word. His sacrificial blood on the cross cleanses your sinful heart and His resurrected life can grant you the newness you need. All you must do is listen to His word. Don't let the Ninevites rise at the judgment and condemn you. Come to Christ and find the new life. The sign of Jonah is this. Jesus swallows your sins by his cross. Sin may belong to us, but salvation belongs to the Lord. For those of us this morning who are facing the second type of storm, there's nothing to do with your sin or disobedience, but simply because you're following the will of God, then you need to accept the storm is the harsh reality that happens to everyone, Christians and non-Christians alike. You're either headed into a storm, in the middle of a storm, or coming out of one. Learn from your storms. God is teaching you something about Himself, about you, and about the storms of life. 
you have a storm theology. Let's refine it, improve it, and use it Christocentrically. See the storm as an opportunity for God to display what Christ has really done for you at the cross. Shall we bow our heads as I conduct this virtual altar call? Does it sometimes seem that God is ignoring you when you need Him most, especially now you are trapped in a storm? Has a storm you have gone through make you stronger or weaker spiritually? And what kind of storm are you facing now? Are you losing your faith in God? My advice to you is look to the cross. The grace of God through Jesus is greater than our sin. God will swallow our sin on the cross. If only we dare to confess our sin of disobedience and return to Him. Shall we all bow our heads to pray? Father, this morning we are glad that your grace is greater than our sin. Some of us have loved ones who seem to be living the high life on the ship to Tashis. Some seem to have gotten away with disobedience. And at times like this, we confess, we do doubt and wonder where you are. Today, we learn that you are not sleeping, even though it seems you are. Thank you for showing us that you are the greater Jonah. We are born our ultimate storm. And therefore, this stirs up greater faith in us towards you, that you are able to help us go through relatively smaller, infinite storms with your grace and power. In your time, you will calm the storm of our life and help us to emerge a better person on the other side of this life. Help us all not to waste this storm of life, but to learn who we are and who you are to us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I think that's about all. Okay, just want to encourage you to uh, go online this coming Saturday to learn uh, about uh, the nature of our hearts, the study of our hearts. Okay, SCG is still on every Saturday, 8 p.m. to 8.30. Thank you, okay, for listening. Thank you for attending this online service. Uh, continue to pray for your country. All right, I, I think the Christians need to continually pray until God answers. I think that's all. Uh, bye. God bless you.